Right, can I now again ask you to join me in um, welcoming uh, the excellencies who are coming through now and joining us here on the stage. Thank you very much. We may all be seated now. His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, His Excellency President Lula da Silva, His Excellency Prime Minister Narendra Modi, His Excellency Minister Wang Wentao, representing President Xi Jinping, Her Excellency Dilma Rousseff, President of the New Development Bank, His Excellency Deputy President Paul Mashatile. May I warmly welcome the Excellencies to this closing session of the BRICS Forum. Today, the business community met, and we will receive a report on the discussions shortly. The discussions that dealt with the substance of the business forum. We will thereafter have the keynote addresses by the excellencies. Those remarks will be the main cause of the meal that we are about to serve. I will therefore confine my remarks as an appetizer to those addresses. I am reminded, dear friends, that it is through trading, through travel, and through dialogue that friendships and lasting relationships are built. And it is remarkable how connected our people, our histories, and our economies in BRICS are. We have more than 2,000 years of trading history between Asia and Africa, with trade delegations reportedly sent by the African pharaohs to India in the age of Ptolemy. More than 1,000 years ago, there was a community of people who lived in this, the southern part of the African continent, near the banks of the Limpopo River. They were manufacturers and traders. They were artists crafting the golden rhinoceros. They traded with the outside world, with India, Arabia, and China, selling ivory and gold, buying pottery from China and glass beads from Persia. They were the people of Mapungupwe. They traded with China during the Song Dynasty. Later, during the Ming Dynasty, the great admiral Zhong He undertook voyages of discovery with a fleet of 300 ships and 28,000 crew, which traveled to the eastern part of the African continent. And they saw the great African trading cities of Sofala and Mogadishu and Mombasa, Africans trading with the world. The age of colonialism saw the first European settlements in South Africa as a refreshment station for the ships en route to India and the Spice Islands of Indonesia. Our histories converged as large land masses were colonized. Indian enslaved people were brought from the Malabar coast to South Africa in the 1600s and 1700s. And later in the mid 1800s, large numbers of Indian indentured laborers were brought to develop South Africa's sugar our sugar industry, leaving a permanent mark in our demographic mix. And Mahatma Gandhi cut his political teeth here in South Africa. 
The age of colonialism saw, too, the start of the industrial scale, transatlantic slave trade, taking captured Africans across the waters in cram ships. And the modern state of Brazil emerged from that continent of the civilization of the Aztecs, the Mayas, and the Incas. And the spirit of Africa is alive in Brazilian culture, the warmth of its people, the music, and the samba that had its origins in Angola and Congo. And Russian history, too, contains connections. The great Russian writer Alexander Pushkin's great-grandfather was an African, Ibrahim Petrovich Ganibal, abducted from Cameroon, taken via Constantinople, and eventually taken to Russia, where he became a nobleman. During the struggle against apartheid, many South Africans stayed in Russia, in China, uh, in India, and as with many other parts of the world, we received material assistance in the struggle for freedom in our land. And so we are connected by history, but not only by history. Today we look forward to matters relating to the future. Today's event is held in this, the industrial heartland of the African continent, an economy with major industrial strengths in traditional sectors, but also with technologies in the space and satellite economy, in the digital sector, in new green technologies, in advanced manufacturing. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, a major industrial exhibition is being held nearby at Gallagher Estate, showcasing products from more than 240 firms with 20 other African countries participating, together with the five BRICS partners. I urge those who have not been there, visit it. We held a manufacturing forum which provided a platform for discussion on green industrialization, on electric vehicle and battery production, playing to Africa's strengths in critical minerals. Excellencies, today the business community spent the full morning in deep discussion about investment, about trade, and about technical cooperation. It is my pleasure, therefore, to invite Mr. Sim Shabalala, the CEO of the Standard Bank Group of South Africa, to summarize the main outcomes and give his reflections. And I invite Sim to take the podium. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Minister, for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous privilege to present this high-level feedback on the BRICS Business Forum 2023. Today, guided by its theme of making accelerated growth and sustainable development a reality, the BRICS Business Forum has held sharply commercial and highly dynamic sessions attended by entrepreneurs, policymakers, business people, and indeed academics from across a number of the member countries and beyond. Talking of commercial dynamism, as the minister has alluded, it is very fitting that the BRICS Business Forum has taken place right here in Santon, here in Johannesburg, the capital of Gauteng. Gauteng generates about 35% of South Africa's GDP, and a large proportion of that is generated right here and it is generated by South Africa's sophisticated and successful large corporations, medium-sized enterprises, and indeed SMEs. This year, for instance, Standard Bank's analysts think that South African listed equities will deliver average earnings per share growth of between 15 and 20%. To put it in perspective, other emerging markets are looking at minus 3% for the same period. And talking of South African corporations, relationships, travel, history, and trade, in the words of Minister Patel, I had the good fortune, ladies and gentlemen, and great honor of speaking this morning on a panel with Chairman Chin of the State Grid Corporation of China, as well as Mr. Ricardo Santon, President of the Brazilian Association of Animal Protein. They spoke about climate change and renewables, 
Words cannot describe the profundity of that moment. As it happens, it was a South African bank, my employer, the Standard Bank Group, which was the sole financial advisor to the State Grid Corporation of China in its 1.8 billion rand acquisition of 100% ownership of seven power transmission companies in Brazil in 2010. I mention this admittedly because it illustrates that South African corporate expertise and connections are an important part of making BRICS into an ongoing commercial reality. South Africa certainly has its fair share of challenges, and I would rate unemployment and inequality as the deepest and worst of these. The wealth of Santon is within easy walking distance of the deep poverty of Alexander, a painful contrast that can be found in all of the BRICS countries, but one that is also highly conducive to innovation in the service of inclusion. For instance, to South African ears, the Brazilian financial services innovations that we heard about today sounded all too familiar. So there are serious challenges here in South Africa, but we also have immense strengths and competitive advantages. As well as the corporations that I've mentioned, these strengths include a strong rule of law, which guarantees that contracts will be observed and that commercial disputes will be settled fairly. They include our freely floating currency, open capital account, extremely skillful and credible central bank, and deep and liquid capital markets. These guarantee that returns on investment are and will remain quickly accessible in the currency of the investor's choice. More competitive advantages arise from what a Chinese panelist called South Africa's celebrity products, Mr. President which include rooibos tea, wine, and unique tourist experiences. This brings us to another of South Africa's strengths, which is South Africa's openness for the business and tourist traveler. People from all of our major trading partners enter South Africa either visa-free or with an e-visa. Further, liberalization of travel and greater encouragement of air links between the BRICS countries and our major trading partners is certainly warranted. Perhaps above all, South Africa's competitive advantage emerges from our well-developed trade and investment network with our fellow Africans. China is indeed Africa's largest trading partner. What is sometimes missed, however, is that South Africa is the second largest exporter to the rest of our beloved continent and its fourth largest import partner. Of course, investors from the BRICS and worldwide do very much want to buy into Africa, given our continent's uniquely favorable demographics, immense natural resources, potential for low-cost industrialization, and increasing market integration under the Africa continental free trade area. For all these reasons, According to the IMF forecasts and on current trends, it is likely that Sub-Saharan Africa will be the fastest growing region of the world by 2030. Standard Bank's analysts foresee that intra-Africa trade could double under the AFCFTA and that there would be a $3.4 trillion investment opportunity in Africa infrastructure emerging from this rapid growth. The bottom line is simple. If investors from BRICS and worldwide want to buy into Africa's enormous growth potential, the place to start is right here, in the square mile of Santon. Today's discussions have examined current intra-BRICS trade and investment trends and explored tangible solutions to unlocking further trade and investment opportunities in the BRICS nations and worldwide. Given that the BRICS nations are agricultural powerhouses, agricultural production and trade were discussed in detail, with many useful comparisons, contrasts, and cross-learnings emerging. Participants were firmly of the view that much room exists for improvement across the BRICS nations regarding agricultural trade and market access. 
The same is true of Africa in general. Given the investments and the right policy environment, Africa can become the breadbasket of the world during this century, what Mr. Matepe called the African century. Another important topic was the just transition. A participant argued, a just transition refers to shifting towards a sustainable and inclusive economy characterized by both social equity and environmental sustainability. Renewable energy is an enormous opportunity for public sector collaboration and private sector investment and trade right across the BRICS and beyond. The theme of entrepreneurship featured strongly. A vibrant SME sector is often the most efficient way to create jobs. And some SMEs become unicorns and even mighty multinationals such as BYD and Tencent of China. Of course, for this to happen, countries need favorable business environments, strong education systems, and the appropriate financing institutions. Participants further argued that opening up market access to entrepreneurs across all BRICS presents an exciting opportunity to foster trade and job creation. And this, align, and this again highlights the value of strong travel links and appropriate visa regimes. Within the general theme of entrepreneurship, there was much discussion of the role of fintechs, an area in which BRICS countries have already established a great deal of expertise and success. On finance for SMEs, participants pointed out correctly that startups are particularly vulnerable to sudden and sharp increases in interest rates. One of the roles for DFIs, therefore, is to provide concessional and patient capital for promising SMEs. Two essential preconditions for a financial system that is able to support both micro-enterprises and lower-income households are the democratization of data and universal access to a stable and credible form of identification. India has led the developing world on both access to data and ID, as has Brazil. In Africa, Kenya's rapid and sustained growth has also been powered by a significant pioneering use of mobile phone to create universal access to finance. The forum discussed the international payment system in some detail. From an African point of view, a highlight of this conversation was the discussion of the Pan-African payment system payment system, which has immense potential to stimulate trade and growth by increasing the spend and certainty and reducing the costs of cross-border payments in Africa. Participants also debated the question of whether, whether a BRICS currency is possible or even desirable, with strong views expressed both for and against, with little consensus being reached. Seen from a banker's perspective, debate would probably progress more fruitfully if the discourse maintained a sharper conceptual distinction between international payments on the one hand and reserve currencies on the other. For example, and as the example of the PAPS illustrates, under certain circumstances it may be possible to simplify international trade and then the payments use collection of domestic currencies without any reference to any international reserve currency. It's also important to be realistic about the necessary characteristics of an international reserve currency. These include being a currency issued by a central bank with very high credibility in the implementation of monetary policy, being the currency of a state or supranational entity with an equally strong track record of fiscal policy and meeting its debts being freely available in large quantities in many jurisdictions, and full convertibility at all times. This set of characteristics cannot be quickly wished or agreed into existence, but can only emerge over a multiple of years as a track record of impeccable credibility and very wide use is built up. Finally, 
The forum also heard of the pleasing progress that is being made in institutional development, setting up sector-specific work streams which allow for concentration and focus on areas of common interest in infrastructure, manufacturing, energy, and financial services. In conclusion, today's discussions have been a very useful step in further unlocking the immense potential for trade and investment amongst the BRICS member countries. Thank you ever so much for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, Sim Shabalala for that report on behalf of the business community. I'd also like to welcome a large number of esteemed uh, guests and delegates, members of cabinet from a number of different countries, heads of the BRICS Business Council chapters, ambassadors and high commissioners. It's now my pleasure to invite the President of the Republic of South Africa, our host, who has inspired us with a vision of Africa and her place in the world. Please welcome His Excellency, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa. Thank you, Program Director, Minister Ibrahim Patel, Your Excellency President Luis Lula da Silva, Your Excellency Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Honorable Ministers and Business Leaders, and Your Excellency President of the New Development Bank, Ms. Dilma Rousseff. I greet you all and it's a great honor to have this opportunity to participate in this leader session of the BRICS Forum. I particularly want to thank Mr. Sim Chabalala for the report that he has just given and particularly underline and appreciate the message that is coming from all of you as business leaders about the immense opportunities that you see in investment across the BRICS countries. The BRICS group of countries exists not only to strengthen government to government relations, but also to forge stronger ties between the peoples of our five nations. It is for this reason that several bodies have been established since the BRICS was formed to enable cooperation across society, be it in business, be it in political parties, be it in the social sector and also in the sporting sector. The BRICS Business Council is a vital and vibrant platform for strengthening economic ties between our respective countries and in forging common perspectives on inclusive economic growth and development as we have heard from the report that has just been tabled by Mr. Chabalala. The changes that have taken place in BRICS economies over the past decade have done much to transform the shape of, glo of the global economy. Together, the BRICS countries make up a quarter of the global economy. They account for a fifth of global trade and are home to more than 40% of the world's population. This agglomeration of these five countries has a major impact on various aspects of global activity and life. As we celebrate the 15th anniversary of BRICS, trade between BRICS countries totaled some $162 billion last year. Foreign investment has played an important role 
in the growth of BRICS economies. Total annual foreign direct investment into BRICS countries is four times greater than it was 20 years ago. However, the new wave of protectionism and subsequent impact of unilateral measures that are incompatible with WTO rules undermine the global economic growth and development. We therefore need to reaffirm our position that economic growth must be underpinned by transparency, by inclusiveness. It must be compatible with a multilateral trading system that supports a developmental agenda. The type of developmental agenda that the five countries that are members of BRICS have embraced right from the onset. We require a fundamental reform of the global financial institutions so that they can be more agile and responsive to the challenges facing developing economies. In this respect, the new development bank established by BRICS countries in 2015 is leading the way. Since its formation, it has demonstrated its ability to mobilize resources for infrastructure and sustainable development in emerging economies without conditionalities. Earlier before coming into the session, I was speaking to the president of the New Development Bank, and she was outlining to me how ready and the New Development Bank is in terms of supporting the development agendas of various countries. And we applaud this, and we appreciate this. BRICS economies have emerged as powerful engines of global growth. Yet the rapid economic, technological, social changes underway create new risks for areas such as employment, equality, as well as poverty in many of the BRICS countries. It is quite heartwarming to hear you as business people, as one listened to Mr. Chabalala's report, also focusing on issues such as poverty reduction and elimination and inequality as well. It isn't often that you hear such very positive and forward-looking messages from the business community. So it's wonderful to be in a forum under the ages of BRICS that you as business leaders are in tune with the developmental agenda that needs to be pursued to lift the people who live in BRICS countries and beyond out of the ravages of poverty and inequality. We therefore call on the business community to join hands with us to identify solutions to these and many other challenges affecting our respective economies. From a South African perspective, there is massive untapped potential for investment in our country and indeed on the African continent as well. In recognition of this potential, the theme for this 15th BRICS Summit is BRICS and Africa Part BRICS in Africa, the Partnership for Mutually Accelerated Growth, Sustainable Development, and Inclusive Multilateralism. Africa is a continent of great opportunity in industrialization process in a variety of sectors. This continent is rich in the critical minerals that will drive business success in the 21st century. The continent has resources of lithium, vanadium, cobalt, platinum,